Hello everyone. Welcome to Net Diligence Virtual Cyber Risk Summit. My name is Heather Osborne and I'm the Director of Global Events and Programming at Net Diligence, a cyber risk assessment and data breach services company. Net Diligence is pleased to bring our thought leading content to the virtual space with this new webinar series. Visit our website at www.netdiligence.com to get more information about our upcoming webinars and in-person events. Before we begin, I'd like to extend our heartfelt gratitude to our Virtual Cyber Risk Summit sponsors, particularly Aspen Insurance, our diamond sponsor. I'd also like to thank our 100 plus speakers for bringing their thought leadership to our program. For today's webinar, we will be using the ON24 platform. Right now, you should be viewing the ON24 dashboard, which shows the live viewing screen. During the webcast, all participants will be in listen only mode. Today's presentation is slated for approximately 45 minutes with 15 minutes at the end for questions. Our panel of speakers will be taking questions throughout the session via the questions widget. Please type in questions during the presentation and click submit. If your question is of immediate import or concerns technical problems, you will receive an immediate answer by text. You can also find a widget entitled resources where you can download assets provided by the speakers and sponsors for each webinar. Just click the resource in the box and it will be automatically downloaded. If you are interested in receiving CLE or CE accreditation for this program, you must stay on for the full duration of the webinar and answer three polling questions that will appear during the course of the program. Additionally, please fill out the participant information questions. This will ensure that you are correctly matched to the state and professional organization. As a reminder, this webcast is being recorded. After the presentation, you will receive an archive link for further review or for sharing. The webinar will also be available for future viewing on our website. Again, thank you for joining the Net Diligence Virtual Cyber Risk Summit. We hope you enjoy the program. Good day, everyone. Welcome to this exciting session at uh, Net Diligence called Here Today, Gun Tomorrow, Business Email Compromise. My name is Daniel Tobak, uh, and I'll be the moderator for today's session. Uh, I'm very excited to introduce the panel members here today, uh, Stephen Ramey from Areta Incident Response, Matt Grayford from the Crypsis Group, Karen Painter Randall from Conley Foley LLC, and Erica Nelson from Alive World. Thank you very much uh, for joining us. We have an exciting session for everybody today. Uh, before we start, we have our first poll question, and I will read it out. What is the difference between spam and phishing? Spam is a can-cooked pork, fish, that are sold in an open market. Phishing is distributed only through email, and spam mail is distributed through the USPS. Spam is an unsolicited sales email and phishing six confidential data, or they're all of the same thing. If you please, please go ahead and submit your answers. So we have a very exciting agenda today. We're going to be discussing different facets of various topics associated to business email compromises. We're going to have different views from uh, actual practitioners who deal with uh, breaches on a daily basis. We're going, to have, uh, we're going to have our outlook from a legal perspective. Uh, and of course, we're going to have uh, a, a, a feedback and a view of this from the insurance and, and carrier perspective. Our agenda today, we really will discuss different types of wire fraud, social engineering, and email hacking, types and ramifications of social engineering, types and ramifications of email hacking, costs associated with social engineering and email hacking, and of course, what everybody's favorite in every session is lessons learned. A fun fact as we begin with our session, the FBI says that business email compromise is now the biggest cause 
of cybercrime financial losses for U.S. organizations. It is estimated that email compromises have reached $1.7 billion in 2019, with an average company losing about $75,000 in each attack. FIA's data based on complaints reported to the Internet Crime Complaint Center aligns with MomCast's State of Email Secure Report in 2019. MomCast research found that two-thirds of organizations have experienced increases in impersonation and business email compromise attacks, with almost three-quarters of them losing money, data, or customers as a result. With the COVID-19 epidemic, we've seen an increase in cyber criminals who are taking advantage of the current situation to propagate numerous types of cyber attacks. The following are examples of some of those scams, business email scams. Although not a new threat, which I think everybody are very familiar with, the economic situation caused and the confusion in the market has caused an increase in legitimate and not so legitimate financial communication. Hackers now know that an urgent request for payment or change in wire structures today may not raise the eyebrows just like before, with all the confusion and the panic and the remote usage. Public health scams are also on the rise, as sending messages claiming to be from the CDC or who. Government check scams. Hackers are sending emails requesting personal information on behalf of the government to process stimulus checks. Robo-scams are also on the rise, where remote workers are more likely to be receiving lots of ounces of robocalls who are working from home, selling COVID-19 test kits, cleaning supplies, medicine, ventilators, and masks. There's also been a lot of data scams, which are increased because of remote users, which comes with increased security. Hackers are hoping that the at-home workers and companies are lowering their online defenses, making it easier to attack and steal personal information. And the all good IT scam. Instead of coming from a CEO, the suspicious call allegedly comes from a member of the IT department asking for usernames and passwords or requesting that certain software can be downloaded while working remotely. <clears throat> I think everybody has been trained by lots of the various uh, cyber awareness training, and this, con this particular scam keeps coming on and on and on. So you're not sure anymore if you're being fished by the organization or the cyber criminals, but I think everybody knows. And diving into what is business email compromise, I would like to turn it over to Karen. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, business email compromise is such a simple scam, it really is surprising that it works at all. As Daniel just mentioned, uh, business email compromise scams are the most costly forms of cybercrime, uh, except for maybe ransomware, which we're all watching very closely. Uh, these types of scams target companies who conduct wire transfers and have suppliers abroad. Uh, it usually involves phony emails sent by an attacker. The attacker spoofs a message from a CEO, CFO, or someone else uh, in high levels of authority at a company, or even real estate escrow firms, and tricks, and that's an important word, tricks someone into wiring funds to the fraudster. Business email compromise attacks are constantly evolving and becoming more sophisticated. It's harder and harder for employees to spot the red flag. Some of the top subject lines, according to Barracuda analysis, are based around the following key uh, phrases. I'm sure a lot of you have seen some of these in your subject line. Let's look at a couple of them. Invoice due. This tricks the recipient of an email to make an invoice payment to an attacker. Direct deposit. This involves an attacker sending a fake email to HR or payroll requesting an update to the employee's direct deposit information. According to a survey done by Barracuda, based upon a random sampling of 3,000 recent attacks, the leading objective of an attack was to scam the victim 
into initiating a wire transfer. There are different types of schemes involved in a business email compromise attack. Business email compromise has a hundred times greater net profit. They rely upon social engineering techniques, making business email compromise hard to detect. Here are some of the most popular types of schemes involved in this type of scam. The bogus invoice scheme. Companies with foreign suppliers are often targeted with this tactic. Attackers pretend to be suppliers, requesting fund transfers through email, call, or even fax for payments to an account owned by fraudsters. The CEO fraud. Everyone is familiar with this one. Attackers pose as the company's CEO or any executive and send an email to the employees in finance, accounting departments, requesting them to transfer money to the account they control. And you'll hear later on from our forensics team that typically recognizance is done before these CEOs or other people in high positions of authority are attacked. Account compromise. An executive or employee's email account is hacked and used to request invoice payments to vendors. This is also a popular scheme. Attorney impersonation. Attackers pretend to be a lawyer or someone from a law firm supposedly in charge of crucial and confidential matters. Normally these requests are done through email or phone and certainly during the end of the business day and especially on a Friday. Data theft, employees under HR and bookkeeping and even auditing departments are targeted to obtain PII, personally identifiable information or tax statements of employees and executives. Such data can be used for future attacks and most importantly and recently something called deep fake. Uh, which everyone is watching very closely, which involves the use of artificial intelligence. I'm going to turn it over. Perfect. Thank you, Karen. And uh, now we're going to turn it over to Steve, who is going to talk to us about uh, and describe what was the old methods the threat actors used to utilize and their new methods when performing their business email compromise attacks. Steve, over to you. Great, thank you, Daniel. Um, if we think of a, uh, when we think of a fishing email, if we think of a fisherman casting a baited hook into the water in hopes to catch a fish, um, in the cyber world, the fisherman is the threat actor. The cast of baited fit, uh, hook is a spoofed or doctored email, and the fish is you. Older tactics of phishing uh, focused on tricking the user into making a wire transfer by spoofing the origin of the email. A very popular tactic used in phishing is spoofing, purchasing a domain that closely resembles their victim by changing an RN to an M, changing the appear as or name on the account to be the name of the CEO or CFO of a company and sending an email from that account, or even sending an urgent request at the end of the day to hurry up and transfer a wire to an account because the CFO is under a time crunch. Phishing emails can be targeted or casted to large audiences. Typically with business email compromises, the phishing email is targeted. Targets can be identified in any form from social media, LinkedIn, Facebook, media, news media, and even stolen address books. Once the threat actor makes contact and the victim responds, they will start to groom the victim by building trust. It's not uncommon for a few emails to fly back and forth between the parties. After the TA or the threat actor builds rapport, then they drop their goal, wire the money to their account. In some instances, the threat actor would re return later to attempt to solicit additional funds. Previously described was the older method used by the threat actors. Currently, while many threat actors still use the older method, we've seen a shift with tactics. Threat actors fish employees for credentials, then log into their email accounts to impersonate that employee. After the threat actor has the credentials, they can do anything within the email account. They can set up forwarding or other rules to move mail items. They can access the address book. They can keyword search emails or read emails, even send emails. Additionally, depending on the permissions of the user accounts, 
threat actor may have administrative access to the enterprise account. Administrator credentials with bad motives is a recipe for disaster. I once responded to a business email compromise where the threat actor obtained the global administrator account, locked out the client from their email accounts, and forwarded all their mail to a Gmail address. The client was locked out for over a week before Microsoft's security team could help them regain access. Now we'll discuss the anatomy of an email compromise. Identifying a target and obtaining credentials usually occur through a phishing email. However, there are other ways to obtain credentials. Credentials can be brute forced, or they can, be, uh, they can be used from a credential stuffing attack. Credential stuffing is becoming a more popular option as there are a tremendous amount of data breaches resulting in lost username and clear text password combinations. It's highly likely that individuals re will reuse their username and password across multiple sites. Matt, what have you seen within the attack lifecycle? So some of the more popular uh, attack vectors we've seen have uh, come in via email and are generally either email attachments or links to external websites. So a lot of times a user will receive an attachment that appears to be a legitimate file, such as a Microsoft Word document or maybe an Excel spreadsheet. And when they launch that document, uh, there will be some sort of prompt, either a security warning asking to enable certain controls or to enable macros on the device. Once the end user recipient clicks those buttons to enable those controls, they will uh, be sometimes be taken to a malicious web page. Um, this web page will be designed to uh, to imitate a known landing page, such as the Office 365 logon portal. And from there, when the end user enters their credentials, thinking they're going to access a, a document or a shared file those credentials will be harvested by the attacker, and then the attacker has access to the mailbox. Matt, maybe you can describe to us what does a typical forensic investigation looks like? Sure. So first we need to determine the extent of the compromise. Was access limited to just one user's mailbox, or did that account uh, and the compromised user have permissions that could lead access to other accounts or services? If the compromised user had administrative rights, the attackers could have delegate access to more mailboxes in the environment. Additionally, since so many cloud services are federated, we need to determine if the threat actor accessed other services, such as SharePoint or OneDrive, where sensitive data is known to reside. The second step in this process is remediation. So this starts with a global password reset and a forced logout of all accounts. This will ensure that the threat actor has been removed from the environment and that they cannot access accounts with the same passwords again. We always recommend adding multi-factor authentication at this step if possible to ensure that the threat actors are fully removed and that the environment is secure going forward. At this point, the environment needs to be audited for any mailbox rules, especially those that are designed to forward or redirect email to external and unauthorized email addresses. The third step is to establish a timeline of compromise, and we'll do this through log analysis from the email environment. The forensic analysis process will show us when the first unauthorized login occurred, and we'll use that data to develop a baseline of access by the threat actor. In this process, we'll determine what activity a threat actor performed based on the available log data. Fourth, we'll search for the phishing message uh, to, to determine what the point of ingress was for the compromised account. Typically, a threat actor's first move when they gain access to an email account is to delete the phishing email used to compromise it. Even if the message was deleted, forensic techniques can determine the sender, subject, and relative timestamps of the message. In some instances, the phishing email can be recovered and used to create rules to block future phishing attempts and serve as training examples for employees. Next, we'll document the attacker's communications. So typically, actors engaging in wire fraud will insert themselves into existing conversations to try to not raise suspicion about their activities. This can happen to internal employees or external business partners. The messages from the email server will be exported for preservation and review. And lastly, uh, counsel helps us determine what notification requirements exist. Since this varies so much from country to country and even state to state, we'll rely on counsel for their expertise in this area and we'll work with them to export the proper data sets for their review. 
Great. Thing. Karen, got a, got a question for you. When, when looking at all of this, what exposure do organizations face if they become a victim of wire transfer or business email compromise? Is it really only the loss of money? Yeah, thanks, Daniel. It, it's, uh, it's not all about the wire, and it's not all about the money. And I think a lot of uh, victims uh, think that that's what it's all uh, about. That's what they tend to focus on until they go through an instant response uh, measure and find out that we need to rule out a compromise to their uh, email account. Breaches will cost an organization on many fronts. Um, unauthorized access to email accounts can lead to other types of exposures. These uh, cyber criminals are squatting in a system for months with, with, without the individual's knowledge and before the attack uh, occurs. And third parties, uh, these attackers may have gained unauthorized access to other sensitive and protected data information, including social security numbers, bank accounts information, and other personally identifiable information. Now, someone may ask, well, how do you know uh, what an attacker may have looked at in a compromised email account? Sometimes incident response teams will go through what we call data mining to determine what was accessed. Uh, in an email account uh, in order to guide us in the notification uh, process. Um, some of you might have heard of Willie Sutton. He was a famous bank robber. He was once asked, why do you rob banks? And in a very puzzling uh, way, he responded, because that's where the money is. Well, the bad guys don't need to rob banks anymore. They're monetizing information from the comfort of their home stealing the new oil of the 21st century, the personally identifiable information, the protected health information, the personal financial information, uh, using some of those topics in the subject line that we discussed earlier. The consequences of unauthorized access or exfiltration of sensitive data from a compromised email account are severe. Studies have shown that 60% of the small to medium-sized businesses fail within six months. Jamalto, uh, one of the major manufacturers of SIM cards, just completed a study. They asked their customers, would you stay with a company if they suffered a data breach? And 70% of those consumers indicated that they would not. So reputational harm um, is something to be seriously concerned about should an organization suffer uh, a, a data breach. Um, I mentioned legal consequences. Obviously, there are class action lawsuits being filed, breach of contact, uh, contract, breach of fiduciary duty, director and officer uh, lawsuits. Um, legal, if we find unauthorized access or exfiltration of sensitive information, could also result in the costly notification process. Right now, there are 50 different states with different breach notification laws. There are different regulations that apply in the event that there was uh, or is a data breach. Other things to be concerned about, other than the wire and the money that you questioned earlier, Daniel, operational damages, business interruptions, and most importantly and recently, uh, people are looking at ethics. If, if you're an attorney, uh, I strongly recommend that you look at ABA Formal Opinion 483, uh, which provides guidelines for how professionals, how attorneys uh, need to respond to a data breach. Thank you, Karen. That's great. That's uh, very interesting when you talk about the, the bank robber. Uh, funny statistic today, 85% of bank robbers either get shot or caught. So, you know, cyber is, uh, is definitely a lucrative crime for the cyber criminals. Uh, where nobody is getting shot or wearing that silly mask that might make you allergic to it. Um, moving on to, uh, you know, would love to ask a question of, of Matt and uh, Steve. Uh, do all business email compromises result in financial loss? What are your thoughts on that? Hey, Daniel, that's a great question. Uh, there's a lot of other impact that BEC can have, uh, starting with the type of data stored in the account. So first we need to consider password reset links for third-party accounts. Um, so just imagine how many other accounts are tied to one of your email accounts. So maybe it's your bank or a cryptocurrency wallet or your social media account. 
Um, if you don't have multi-factor authentication on those services uh, and somebody compromises your email account, they could very easily gain access to other services. Uh, there's also the question of sensitive information, which we sort of hit on here, but once a threat actor has access to a mailbox, they can download messages and attachments at will. So if email is being used to transmit sensitive information, this can lead to a data exposure uh, and you know, a notification obligation potentially. Um, and lastly, we need to um, you know, think about invoices and receipts. So if um, uh, you know, you're in a position where you are dealing with invoices quite regularly, a threat actor can take one of those existing invoices and manipulate it to add unauthorized wire information and send it back to business partners or even customers and that can lead to uh, further wire fraud and, and damages along the way. Great yes, point. In addition Steve, to all of to that, add? sure. Yeah. In addition to all that, um, you know, the threat actor has access to your emails directly, so they could copy um, snippets of those emails to learn the language, learn the style uh, of email flow, and then they can use that in other attacks going forward, whether it's against the organization from a, another organization or other organizations that that current victim does business with. Perfect. Uh, great points. Uh, we're going to move over to we're going to move over to our question number 2 in our in our polling is uh, true or false? Uh, business email compromise costs US businesses over 2 billion dollars per year. True or false? Submit uh, submit your answers. Thank you for submitting those uh, polling questions. Uh, and we're going to move over to transferring the risk with Erica. Uh, Erica, thank you very much for joining us. And I have a question for you. What can an insured expect from cyber insurance? Are all policies the same and have consistent coverage? What are your thoughts on that? Thanks, Daniel. What I will say is that generally what a cyber policy seeks to do is help an insured respond to an incident. And generally, I'm having policyholders either email or call us, and they've never confronted this issue before. So it's really putting in place both first-party coverages and third-party coverages to assist through the life cycle of the claim. And we'll talk a little more about that as we go on. But I did want to note for you that because this is such a banding market, and as you can see, Lloyd's of London estimates an $85 billion market for cyber insurance, you can imagine there's a large amount of carriers getting into this space. So what that means is they need to differentiate their product. And all these, although you may see very standard first party and third party core coverages, which we'll talk about, these carriers, in order to differentiate themselves, are offering additional optional offerings to help make sure that they can get the sale. I also wanted to note for you that in addition to the standalone policy, you're going to see potential crime coverages and supplemental privacy coverages on other types of policies. So you could have a standalone crime coverage providing social engineering and wire, wire fraudulent wire transfer coverage. You may also see an add-on to a professional liability policy or a package policy affording supplemental privacy coverages. So when you're thinking about cyber insurance, you and your broker should be thinking about big picture, what other types of policies you also have, and what potential coverages may respond to an incident. Great, uh, great points. Yeah, great points. And since there are both first and third party coverages under most cyber policies, in the situation of a back or a wire, wire fraud scam, how does the claim process work as it relates to first and third party coverages? Are you able to shine some light on this? Absolutely, Daniel. And like I said in the, the first slide, the goal of your cyber policy is to help you be prepared to respond to an incident. 
the first party coverage is the first question I'm asking from a policyholder when they report an incident is, do you reasonably suspect that there is somebody in your system? In the old method that we talked about earlier on, a lot of times these, these wire transfers were a result of a spoofing email. So maybe that bad actor was not in the network. But as we're seeing, as, as bad actors are getting better at what they do, they're in the insured system. So first and foremost, we're looking at the incident response services, hiring breach consultation law firms to provide legal advice, retaining forensic firms like Arite and Cripsis to get in there, secure the system, and figure out where these bad actors have been. In that vein, a large cost associated with these incident response coverages with the new method is the data mining component. So if you have had multiple business email compromises ac across your network, that data has to be mined. And there's two ways of doing that. One is a technology-assisted review, and the other is manual review, meaning somebody physically looking at those documents. And just to give you a little feedback, uh, Matt's here with Cripsis, and I thought he could give a little background on how Cripsis utilizes technology-assisted review during the data mining process. Sure thing. So many of us are familiar with the process of e-discovery and data mining to detect things like PII, PCI, and PHI. Uh, so you know, sort of the old method relies on data matching. For example, you might have a nine-digit number, and it fits the pattern for a Social Security number. That hit for sensitive data would be sent to a review team where the context is reviewed to determine if the hit is legitimate and if it requires notification. At Cripsis, we've developed a more efficient, cost-effective method of technology-assisted review for these kinds of tasks. Uh, we have a, a uh, service line that involves Cripsis Illuminator, which combines uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence with deep data analytics to give a faster, more reliable, and less expensive method of data review that ultimately de delivers a defensible product and minimizes the need for manual review. Thanks, Matt. And I'll just say as a carrier and as an adjuster who regularly handles these incidents, we see a huge savings, um, particularly with data that is not rich with PII and PHI. Obviously, depending upon the type of organization will dictate how much of the data ultimately has to be reviewed. So we're working through that process with the insured, also providing the appropriate notice to affected individuals, that's the credit monitoring um, notice to them as well as regulatory entities. There's also first party coverage and different insuring agreements of standalone cyber policies that, re that respond to the network extortion, the ransomware. Um, as as you can imagine, as we work through this process, looking at what potentially could come down the road. And that's where we go into third-party losses and third-party liability coverage. In incidents where you're sending out a large notification to affected individuals and or noticing multiple regulatory entities, potentially AGs from multiple states, OCR, there's, an, there's a likelihood there's going to be an investigation um, and or potential class action or demand from some of these affected individuals. Standalone cyber policies also provide this third-party liability coverage that appoints defense counsel, defends the insured, and ultimately would pay a judgment or settlement in that matter. I will note for you that there is a push to cover regulatory fines and penalties, um, and that primarily stems from the regulatory landscape. Thank you, Erica. Some, uh, some great information. Can you give us some uh, on how to avoid large fines from regulatory entities after an incident? I know that's always been a big question that's been going around. So I'd, I'd send this over to Karen, but in my experience um, in working with insureds, a lot of the potential to avoiding a fine is having good security before an incident. But Karen, you're in this space all the time. What do you see with respect to um, OCR investigations, AG investigations? Are, are they coming, hard on the insured, coming down hard on the insured for pre-breach conduct or post-breach conduct or both? Yeah, I think that most organizations are still underestimating just how damaging a data breach, um, including fines, um, can be. Uh, the average cost of a data breach is approximately $4 million. I think that's what the recent Poneman Institute study revealed. But uh, a lot of those um, 
numbers uh, are are calculated with uh, regulatory uh, in fine uh, fines. Uh, privacy regulation, Eric and Daniel, is certainly on the rise. We see it all the time. Uh, there's more than 80 countries that have some sort of data privacy uh, regulation in in place. Uh, one of the regulations that I think a lot of people are eyeing very closely is the GDPR, and this gets back to what Daniel asked, and that is what can you do to avoid these exorbitant uh, fines. Um, in its first year, the GDPR uh, fines exceeded $57 million. Um, it doesn't sound like a lot, but since its inception uh, over a year and a half ago, there's been over 160,000 breaches followed with enforcement fines of approximately $126 million. As you all probably saw in the news, British Airways paid uh, $230 million in fines for its data breach that impacted over 500,000 customers. So with um, this being um, looked at more and more uh, closely, obviously the question is what do we do to avoid these large fines? I do agree with Erica. Take that holistic approach to security. It is a process. It is not a product. Um, conduct your assessment. Understand what the laws require of you. Understand where your data is. Make sure that you're in compliance with the U.S. laws and regulations. And follow data security frameworks like, like this. It's an easy framework to follow. Gone are the days that you, know, you can still stick your head uh, in the sand. Uh, most importantly, have that instant response team and plan in place so that you can respond quickly within 72 hours or within the time frame of the breach notification statute or the regulation because that's where they'll catch you if you don't uh, respond in a timely fashion. Having that experienced instant response team and plan in place with the legal, the forensic, the insurance to guide you is extremely important to make sure that you follow those timelines. And just one, one, one thing that I'm adding that probably we didn't discuss uh, before in any programs, and that is you know, be aware of the international requirements and prepare for an international breach, especially with GDPR and all of the other um, EU data protection authorities uh, lining up uh, to become involved uh, if a U.S. company or any other organization happens to have violated their, um, their laws. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Erica, maybe, maybe let's talk about coverage uh, enhancements. Uh, um, are there any particular coverage enhancements offered by carriers? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and to feed off of what Karen was saying and talking about GDPR, for example, um, as regulation changes, you know, everybody is concerned about whether or not there's going to be coverage potentially uh, for those fines and penalties. So in the marketplace, you will see, you know, endorsements addressing specific uh, regulatory changes. So there, there's GDPR endorsements out there. Um, the base policy form may already already cover it, but you may see the endorsement just as to clarify and to and to send out into the market that yep, these are covered um, fines and penalties. Um, in addition to that, a lot of our insureds are very large organizations, sophisticated organizations, and they like using, you know, a law firm that they're comfortable with and that they work with regularly. So as part of the underwriting process, we do generally talk about um, endorsing on some breach consult firms, some defense counsel firms, as well as forensic providers they may already work with. Um, it is a dynamic process and part of, part of the underwriting process. In addition to that, most carriers provide some sort of risk management as it relates to pre-breach services. And I wanted to ask, um, Stephen, I, I know that I, I know that you provide some of those services in a pre-breach context to carriers uh, that policyholders can take advantage of. Is there any is there any examples you can provide us as to those types of services being provided pre-breach? Uh, certainly, and I'll, I'll start off this way. Uh, while every cyber policy is different, we have seen more insurance providers offering pre-breach assistance and coverage. So you should check with your insurance policy or with your, your provider if pre-breach offerings are covered. Um, but regarding the services, um, you know, cyber consultants can certainly help with, with uh, cybersecurity planning in general. 
uh, anything from establishing a, a virtual chief information security officer or VCSO to actually building out your incident response plans and, and capabilities. Uh, the VCSO program is um, something that uh, more cyber companies are, are offering because the, the, the chief information security officer isn't a role that's in every organization. So the virtual aspect of this role is companies buy a block of hours and then they run their their cyber related questions through their VC cell. And this allows them for any regulatory requiring, requir um, reporting requirements uh, to list their actual uh, VC cell as, as a contact person on behalf of the organization as well as if they want to um, build out or, or improve their current cybersecurity, um, they have someone that's knowledgeable, that's an expert, they can rely on to help them build that roadmap. And other, other services uh, these, these uh, forensic firms will offer are tabletop exercises or stress testing your organization's response plans, penetration tests and vulnerability assessments, as well as threat hunting. Now, threat hunting is a new concept uh, where a lot of organizations assume they've been breached. Not they actually know they have, but they assume they have. And then they bring a team in to prove that they haven't been um, breached. And so threat hunting is a way to actively um, review your environment, to look for indicators of compromise, and then remediate accordingly. Thank you, Stephen. That's very helpful. And there's there's a plethora of different services that are being offered pre-breach, so that's definitely something an insured should take advantage of from a carrier perspective. It just makes you a better risk uh, and makes a better partnership going forward. Thank you, Erica and, and the team. Uh, some, some great and very important points. And let's uh, now go into the five best practices uh, tips on, uh, on, how, on how to deal with this properly. We have uh, security awareness training at the top of the list, be aware and suspicious, establish a wire transfer policy, implement good cybersecurity basics, and of course, procure cyber liability insurance. And Stephen Matt, what are your thoughts on, on some of these best practices tips uh, that you always recommend to your clients? Uh, certainly uh, start with a phishing assessment or a phishing awareness training. Uh, understanding, you know, the likeliness of your employees to click on, on fake emails uh, will certainly help. Uh, and also teaching them what a, fi uh, what a fake email would look like uh, to minimize the uh, chances they would actually click on any links. And going just a step beyond the awareness training, you know, that is extremely important to understand the scope of what could take place in the environment. Um, but as well, you know, seeing what controls we can add into the environment uh, to help improve our security posture. So some, some easy quick wins would be to uh, enable multi-factor authentication. That's going to give us the biggest return on investment there. Uh, setting a strong password policy to ensure that passwords can not easily be broken. Um, and to set up some um, uh, rules inside the email environment. So don't use legacy mail protocols that would allow for uh, some unauthorized connections to download email and stop the auto-forwarding of email. So uh, essentially not letting users create those auto-forward rules in your email environment. Great points. Guys, I'm sorry, I clicked the, the next button by, by accident. 
Jesus. Can we can we stop for a second? Thank you, Stephen, Matt. And, and now I want to turn it over to some of the hot cyber trends for 2020. And Erica, what are your thoughts on this? Thanks, Daniel. You know, particularly because we are in the work from home environment, we've been seeing an increase in social engineering and wire fraud scams. Uh, and the takeaway is the additional education to your, to your employees, sending out those trainings, and making them hyper vigilant during this time period. Because as we sit, you know, in an unfamiliar place, we're not as, as vigilant and, and we're not recognizing those risks in the same way that we would had we be sitting at our, you know, in our cubicles. So I would just uh, make sure that you're reminding your employees of, of this risk. Um, and we're going to see more of these incidents going forward uh, the longer we remain in the, the work from home environment. Absolutely. Karen? Yeah, I think as I mentioned earlier that the artificial intelligence is here. Uh, and I think the use of artificial intelligence to mimic the voice of an organization's CEO or other key stakeholder um, uh, will be used more and more. Cyber criminals will probably take advantage of artificial intelligence and deep fakes to give more credence to um, the attacks. It's something that happened to Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook. Uh, there was a video, a uh, fake video of him posted to Instagram. Uh, showing him saying whoever controls the data controls the future and uh, people thought it was him but I can see you know people using deep fakes to try to uh, fool or trick individuals to uh, transfer money to fraudsters. Absolutely it's gotten so easy to do uh, some of this uh, gray area gray area activities that uh, is it's unfortunately getting popular there. Uh, Matt and Steve Sure. Uh, even with uh, multi-factor authentication uh, enabled, you know, you're still seeing a high number of business email compromises because of uh, misconfigurations allowing legacy protocols enabled. Essentially, the, the attackers are able to bypass multi-factor authentication um, because they have a username and password, and the account allows IMAP or POP uh, access. And echoing you know, sort of what Erica said here about our new work from home environment, uh, with just this huge increase in the number of people working remotely, there's been a surge of attackers who are taking advantage of the situation. Uh, there's a lot of organizations that just weren't ready for remote access and had to rapidly provision uh, that access and technology for off-site users. So the fast pace of those changes has led to oversights and security controls, and it provides threat actors with numerous ways to compromise services inside an organization. Great points. Um, we're going to move over now to our final poll question. True or false? Social engineering is the use of deception to manipulate individuals into divulging confidential or personal information that may be used for fraudulent purposes. Please click your votes now. Perfect. I wanted to thank everybody on this uh, amazing panel today for their insight and expertise uh, on this very important matter of business email compromises and, and wire fraud. Uh, I would like to turn it over to any questions that we may uh, provide feedback on. Thank you, everyone. Perfect. Thank you, everyone. And uh, we want to turn to some questions that we have had the, from the audience, uh, very engaging and thought-provoking questions. And, uh, and let's start with, with the first one. So, uh, uh, panel, let's take it away. Hi, Daniel. Uh, this is Karen Randall, and I hope everyone enjoyed the 
the BEC uh, webinar that we just produced is certainly is a top uh, topic for many people and many organizations as it presents such a huge risk um, and consequences. One of the questions that we got uh, was from Kate Grayson, and I thought it was a great question, uh, and that is, what are the best ways of reporting email accounts and bank accounts involved in fraud? Are these methods typically helpful in catching the groups responsible for business email compromise? Um, I think the title of our program probably is very appropriate uh, for this question. Here today, gone tomorrow, uh, quite appropriate. Uh, there are um, many methods that can be taken to reduce your risk, but before we even talk about the business email attack, I, I want to mention that it is extremely important uh, that any organization have an incident response plan in place before a business email compromise attack uh, takes place. The primary, uh, the primary reason for that is because it's important to act quickly, as we all know. The first 72 hours um, is absolutely critical. After 72 hours, the chances of recovery of the wire drop significantly. Um, the incident response plan should include building a pre-attack relationship with not only the financial institutions, uh, but also law enforcement. Uh, the financial institutions that you do business with um, should have information with regard to how they respond to a business email compromise attack so that you have a comfort level. Um, should one of these attacks take place, Kate, um, you know, it's important to contact the financial uh, institution upon discovery of the fraudulent wire transfer. It's also important to request that that financial institution contact the corresponding bank where the wire was sent. Um, you should consider filing a complaint with the FBI uh, Complaint Center. It is located at IC3. The website is available if you, if you Google it. Um, but um, there are also other resources out there, including the U.S. Uh, Secret Service and CISA, Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency. It's very important for you to be aware of um, those resources and entities. Um, designate someone within your organization to um, follow the intel that they release and make sure that you share that intel with management, with your IT team, and employees. Um, with regard to recovery of wire, um, I have not seen a lot of success with it, especially if the report comes in after 72 hours. I know that sometimes there is a limit with the amount of the wire um, before it catches the attention of uh, of law enforcement. Um, so I hope that helps, and I'll turn it back over to Daniel. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much for that great answer. One thing about uh, when it comes to wire fraud, you know, what we have also seen in the industry is, is sometimes a little bit more luck than actual technical. If the wire goes out on a Friday after a certain particular time, it could get stuck in an intermediate bank over the weekend, uh, and then potentially you have some type of uh, 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 mechanism on, on that Monday or Sunday to retrieve it back, but, but absolutely, once it's gone 70 hours, the money is gone. Uh, let's move to our next question. Uh, and this question is uh, for, uh, you know, for, 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 for Erica. Um, are carriers providing coverage for reputational harm? Thanks, Daniel. As I briefly talked about during the slide, there's, there's really a variety of optional and additional coverages that are being offered in the marketplace. And one of those coverages is for net income losses as a result of a reputational incident. Um, as I touched upon, there's a lot of carriers coming into the marketplace, and this is one of those additional or add-on coverages that is being added to the standalone cyber policy. What we generally see is that this coverage responds after a large-scale notification or media coverage of a privacy incident. So you can imagine that, uh, in the context of like a large retail sales um, company where customers no longer feel comfortable uh, going in and shopping at that facility, that's something that would trigger this reputational incident um, and could arise, uh, a net income loss could arise from that. I hope that answers the question. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I want to direct a question to Matt. Matt, is it possible to detect a, a business email compromise before a problem occurs? 
That's a really good question, Daniel. So many cloud-based email providers uh, allow you to add alerts, so your administrator can add alerts to these systems based on certain criteria. Um, so you could add alerts for things such as new forwarding rules being added to an account, or when a logon occurs from overseas when you're a you know, US-based company with nobody traveling, things like that. Uh, so those kind of give you a good start on early detection. Um, the thing to keep in mind is that the organization must have somebody uh, or, or a team of people ready to respond to those events when they do come in. Uh, for larger organizations, we regularly work with the client and a SOC to provide some 24 by 7 monitoring to detect, prevent business email compromises. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, you know, so you know this this question is uh, you know I, I can direct it to to somebody on the panel. Um, but you know, w once a business user's credentials are stolen, uh, how 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 are hackers are able to use those credentials to access the network if a VPN is required? Matt, maybe we can direct this to you. I think that question might be better geared for one of our uh, insurance carriers, yeah? Uh, just maybe we can give it a more of a technical uh, in technical answer just from a VPN is, is the same credentials from that point of view. Maybe I we can skip that. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'll go ahead with that one, Daniel. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, Fair if enough. The, no, it's if the okay. VPN, if the VPN is using the same credentials as the employee's email, so if that was the case uh, uh, with something implemented such as single sign-on, the attacker might be able to access the VPN on the network. Um, you know, with the rush of work from home that we've had, some organizations have uh, publicly published their VPN instructions so it can be accessed off the network. And it's just a byproduct of everybody rushing to enable this remote access early. Um, if they have the server information and the credentials are indeed the same, an attacker could access the network. Uh, the question is, do they have the uh, technical information, you know, including the server info, and perhaps even uh, what services are being used for VPN to to go ahead and make that connection? Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I do have a question here from the audience, and maybe Stephen, you can you can assist us with that. Where can we find more information about improving security with accessing email? Stephen, maybe you're on mute. Yep, sure was. Um, uh, you were, you were mentioned... brilliant, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. I'm glad somebody noticed. Um, you know, your managed service provider and your cloud hosting provider should have all that information on hand. Um, they should have the thorough documentation that would um, and services they would offer to help you secure your email uh, account. Uh, Microsoft, who hosts Office 365, has the Azure Security Center. Google has something um, similar. And depending on your licenses with uh, any of your products, uh, you could add you know, instant add-ons um, that you can uh, use to increase the security as well as uh, some of these other add-ons may require additional subscription fees. Uh, but it's definitely worth looking, f uh, looking at uh, to improve your, um, your, your security posture. Uh, then if in doubt, you know, you could ask anybody on this panel here, uh, follow with them, because um, we all have, you know, we've been there, done that uh, many of times. And so we're happy to provide our guidance and recommendations for uh, how to improve our security. Got it. Perfect. Thank you very much. That's uh, that's great feedback. Uh, <clears throat> I think we can turn to a couple uh, more questions. Uh, how does uh, failure to enable a robust email, email logging impact the legal analysis from a reporting perspective? Karen, maybe maybe you want to take a crack at it. Yes, Daniel? Yes. Yeah. Yes, I apologize for that. Um, so thank you for the question. Um, obviously, um, you know, we have some individuals on the phone who uh, will probably take a key uh, or play a key role um, in a forensic investigation. But 
Um, certainly when incident response counsel works with a forensic firm, uh, they take a look at forensic artifacts. Uh, logs are um, very important. Um, sometimes they are only complementary uh, to the forensic artifacts that are uh, collected. Um, but with everything that the forensic team does, we coordinate our efforts with them and the client, and we reach ultimately conclusions with regard to access or exfiltration based upon the evidence and based upon the evidence alone. Um, from that evidence, you know, we interpret the notification laws, um, the state of residency for the individuals who may have been impacted, and we make a determination as to whether or not the findings drive uh, notifications um, in those states, uh, legally speaking, regulatory speaking, and as I mentioned before in our program, um, if there are attorneys or law firms involved, there is also now formal opinion 483 that drives a different bucket of notification as it applies to the confidentiality of the material that may have been accessed or exfiltrated. Perfect. That's great. Karen, just while we're on the topic, really another question. With a, a, a Beck attack, is the lost wire transfer the only exposure clients are facing? Absolutely not. I mean, again, the title here today, Gone to Mars, is important, and I think a lot of people will focus on the money. Uh, you know, they want to follow the money trail. We, you know, we have China and Nigeria and Russia and uh, North Korea. Everyone's trying to get their hands through social um, engineering on these, these wire transfers. But what's important is that, you know, when, when someone becomes a victim of these types of attacks, um, they focus on that wire transfer, and it's usually incident response counsel and forensics that has to break the news to them that if their um, email account or that we should investigate whether or not their email account has been compromised. You know, did the attacker get in, squat for a period of time, uh, conduct recognizance possibly through LinkedIn and other social media sites, you know, when to pull the trigger, establish those rules as the forensic um, group mentioned before during the webinar um, to redirect the wire transfer. But while they squat, they also look at sensitive information, possibly in the emails, the social security numbers, the bank account information, protected health information. And if they're there and uh, we find evidence of access or exfiltration, data staging and things of that sort, while they're squatting in the Amerabox account, we're looking at um, a, a complete and full investigation uh, relevant to what impact, if any, uh, that squatting and infiltration of the email account um, had uh, on on the victim. That is that is perfect and, and some outstanding feedback. Um, we are we are going to be uh, wrapping it up uh, with our with our seminar with our today. I hope everybody enjoyed. I wanted to say a big thank you to all the experts on the panel who has provided real-time um, advice and expertise from their hands-on experience. I, I hope this was valuable for everybody joining. Uh, thank you again, and uh, see you soon. Have a great day.